in the middle of a fear or in a storm, the Lord can bring us peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so, experiencing God's peace. And we know the Scriptures also encourage us to cast all our cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. It's a peace that surpasses every thought and understanding. God, in verse 8, the psalm I read says, that he will watch over your life. And isn't that a comfort today? You know, in response to the time that we're living, we're going to begin this month, uh, a month of prayer, this month of October. There's going to be Zoom prayer times each Wednesday in October at 7.30, as well as the Friday prayer. Now, I know that Zoom isn't everyone's cup of tea. It's a challenge to connect through Zoom. But it's all we have at this, at this moment in time. So let's make the best we can of it. And so can I encourage you to log in on Wednesday evenings? And if you have any prayer requests or feel that the Lord is guiding you with how we should develop as we go through our month of prayer, then please contact Peter or me. And if you'd like to connect but don't at the moment get the Zoom links, then again, please contact Peter or me about that. And so as we come to worship, let's reflect on the goodness of God today. The goodness of God, the love of our Savior, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me just pray as we begin. Lord, guide our thoughts today. Guide our thoughts during this time of worship to really reflect on your love, on your strength, on your protection, on your greatness, on your provision for us. To really worship you. Help us to engage and connect with you today, even if we're doing it online. And although we're at a distance from one another, may our hearts be close together and close to you. Mm. Lord, help us to put aside all of the distractions, all of the anxious thoughts, while we place our whole trust in you. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to stand and we'll worship this morning. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who oh, the sun sets free Oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Free last he is ransomed his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free who is free indeed i'm a child Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, 
was free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am who the sun sets free. Who the sun sets free. Who is free indeed. I'm a child. our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection when we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, and I believe in you. eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus, for I 
believe in the name of Jesus. Are there in God? There are three persons in one God The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit There are three persons in one God How many persons are there in Hello everyone, welcome to our Sunday School. How are you keeping? In this video, we are going to have a quick recap of question 2 and move to question 3. Question 1. What's our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong to God. Question 2. What is God? God's the creator of everyone and everything. And today's question is question number 3. How many persons are there in God? There are three persons in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our memory verse is in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Today, you are going to learn a really difficult concept about God. Listen carefully. But don't worry, it doesn't matter if you don't get it fully. Even for adults, this concept of God is hard to understand. The concept we are talking about is the Trinity Doctrine. Have you ever heard the word Trinity? It means that God is one, but also three. The word Trinity means Three unit. Three means three, and unit means one. It reveals that God is three persons who all have the same essence of God. There is only one God. Deuteronomy 6 4 says, Israel, listen to me. The Lord is our God. The Lord is the one and only God. God is three persons, as our memory verse of 2 Corinthians 13 14 says. Each person is fully God. The Bible speaks of the Father as God, Jesus as God, and the Holy Spirit as God. 
Each person is fully God and not one third of God. Each person of Trinity is different from the others. Because the Father sent the Son into the world, the Father cannot be the same person as the Son. Likewise, after the Son returned to the Father, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit into the world. Therefore, the Holy Spirit must be distinct from the Father and the Son. The three persons of Trinity relate eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please read 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 5 to 14 at home with your parents. In this letter, Paul is writing to Corinthians because there are lots of problems in the Corinthian church that Paul wants to address. Paul mentions the three persons of the Trinity in verse 14 because he is trying to show the Corinthians how important God is for their lives and relationships with one another. Paul first identifies Jesus, God the Son, as the one who displays God's grace clearly in his life and death. Grace is kindness shown to someone who does not deserve it. Jesus Christ is the person of the Trinity who reveals God's grace to us. Paul then prays that the Corinthians would know the love of God the Father. Children, Those who know the great love of God as Father are the ones who accepted the sacrificial death of Jesus for their sins and were made sons of God. Finally, Paul prays that the Corinthians would know the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit. Children, the Spirit is the one who brings sinners into friendship with God and into friendship with one another. The experience of grace, love, and friendship is the result of being in a relationship with God. Jesus shows us the grace of God. The Father shows us love. The Holy Spirit draws us into fellowship. These three are one. What a wonderful and perfect God we have. Each time we get to know more about our God, we are amazed and filled with wonder, and our hearts sing with praise to God who formed all the creation. So let's pray. Dear God, you are awesome. You created the ocean, the earth, the universe. You are so powerful and great, and at the same time, you love us so much, even though we are sinners. You sent your only son Jesus to die on the cross and wash away our sins. Jesus, thank you for your grace above us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you came to live in me, to guide me through all my life as a child of God. Dear God, please grant us understanding that by learning about the Trinity, we will have a much bigger understanding of Who you are. So here we finish one more Sunday school lesson. It was a wonderful time together. Please commit yourself this week. Turn with me to Psalm 121. It's the Psalm I read actually at the beginning of our time together this morning. Psalm 121. It's a short Psalm, just eight verses. And I'm reading from the New International Version. And Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. You know, friends, I love being a Christian. I love the fact that all of my problems as a Christian are solved. All my questions have been answered. And all my troubles are now over. As a Christian... I thank God that I'm a member of that privileged group of people who no longer have to worry about accidents or, or arguments or misunderstandings or rebellious children or illnesses. 
In fact, if any of those things do befall me, whether it's a disease or a car accident or a fight with a husband or a wife, children that won't listen as they should, it's a sure sign that something must be going wrong with my relationship with God. That somehow I've gotten off track. I've taken a detour on the road to faith. So God has become maybe tired of my wavering and my fickle faith, and he's gone off to look for someone else who is more deserving of, my, of his attention. Our circumstances are as a result of our own faithlessness. I'm, if I'm going through a difficult day, it's because something is wrong with my relationship with God, and maybe God has just got tired of me. Does any of that sound right to you? Are my conclusions correct? When we go through difficult times, is God angry? Is God tired? Is God fed up? Is God bored with us? Have you ever thought like that, though? I know that I have. Sometimes I'm tempted to think in that, in that exact way. But when I do, I am wrong. And I know I'm wrong because the Bible tells me I'm wrong. But sometimes I'm still surprised as a Christian when bad things happen, to me or to others, even when difficult things happen. Despite what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45, it says this, For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, there are things that happen to us that are common to all humanity. But there's still a little part of me that thinks that if I were a better Christian and God really, fully, truly loved me, then no, no, no bad things would ever happen to me. Deep down, we are often unable to reconcile our belief in God's love and care for us with all the bad stuff that life throws our way. When we're in the middle of a really difficult time for us as Christians, things are not normal at the moment, are they? This is a difficult time for us collectively, as God's people. We're distant. We maybe feel alone. We're feeling not really connected, under stress, anxiety, or pressure. The late author Eugene Peterson of the Message Bible wrote this. He says, No sooner have we plunged into the Christian river of faith than we get our noses full of water and come up coughing and choking. No sooner do we confidently stride out on the road to faith than we trip on an obstruction and fall on a hard surface, bruising our knees and our elbows. For many, the first great surprise of the Christian life is in the form of the troubles we meet. Somehow, it's not what we had supposed. Something bad happens to us, and we look around for whatever help we can find. Well, you know, we do sometimes stumble, and we do sometimes find trouble. Sometimes there is confusion in our lives. Sometimes there is real pain. And we ask the same question. And notice that the psalm we read begins to address that. It says this, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come from? Question mark. We want help. We need help. We want answers. Now, I can say that there will come a day when there will be no more sadness, no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears, but it's not on this earth. That day will come, but that's a story for another day. Taking a look closer at Psalm 121, it said, tells us about our circumstances and how we can face them and where we should seek help. Well, to start, our psalm is perfect for those on a journey. In fact, Psalm 121 is just the right song for somebody traveling by foot. First of all, it says in verse 3, He will not let your foot be moved. We see a reference there to stumbling feet. If you were on a journey by foot, it would be easy to step on a loose stone, to fall, to sprain your ankle, Verse 6 refers to the fact that when someone is exposed to the hot sun for a long time, that they might be at risk of sunstroke. A 
At the same verse warns of the danger of the moon, that is, moonstroke, or the possibility that a person traveling for a long distance on foot under pressures of fatigue and anxiety can become emotionally ill. Ancient writers described this as moonstroke. Later, it was called lunacy, from the Latin word luna. It is from these traveling dangers that the Lord protects us, according to the Psalm 121, from physical, from mental, from emotional pressures. And we can add to these things anything that might intrude into our lives and cause us difficulties, struggles, trials, problems. And sometimes it seems that no matter what precautions we take, that even with our seatbelt fastened and the doors securely closed, we can't ever guarantee our own security and safety. We all know Christians who fall and sprain their ankles. We know Christians who struggle with anxiety and depression. But doesn't the psalm say that the Lord will not let the sun strike you? Doesn't it say that he will not let you stumble? Which is right, the psalm or our experience? Is it any wonder there are Christians who end up thinking that their struggles are a sign that there is surely something wrong with their relationship with God and that he has left them alone? If God hasn't left them alone, would they still be stumbling? Would they be getting moonstruck? And so we see the psalm at the beginning say, I lift my eyes to the hills. Because we end up thinking sometimes that God must have abandoned us, that our troubles are a sure sign of this, we look elsewhere for help in our trouble. Question is, when we look around for help, what do we see? Whenever I travel out to Connemara, maybe to visit someone, when you pass Uchterard, you begin to see the mountains rise up before you. Here are magnificent mountains that reach right up to the sky. And what better image of firmness and stability and strength can you find? No wonder the psalmist looked up to the mountains. And so whenever I used to read this psalm, I thought that it meant that when I lift my eyes up, I'll see Jesus. I'll see him riding over the mountain, bathed in sunlight, coming to my rescue. Not so. A writer, the writer here, the Hebrew person writing 3,000 years ago, would have seen something quite different if they looked up to the hills or the mountains. During the time that this psalm was written and sung, Canaan, Israel, what was becoming Israel, was overrun with popular pagan worship. And much of that religion was practiced on high places, in mountains and hills, hilltops. Shrines were set up. Groves of trees were planted. Sacred prostitutes, both male and female, were part of worship. People were lured to the shrines to engage in acts of worship that would enhance the fertility of the land that would make them feel good and would protect them from evil. So the hills offered protection and spells for travelers. Are you worried about the sun's heat? Well, go and see the sun priest and pay him for protection and he'll make sure the sun doesn't harm you. The most prominent pagan gods were Asherah and Baal or Baal. They weren't exactly impressive gods. They had too many human attributes. For instance, the legends of Baal show him being immoral, a drunken god. They talk about how difficult it was to wake him, especially after he was drinking. They couldn't wake him because he was asleep. Remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on the Mount Carmel? He taunted the priests by saying, perhaps Baal is asleep and must be awakened in 1 Kings 18. You couldn't even guarantee that Baal would help you if you called on him. You'd have to wake him up first. So really, the mountains and the hills in Psalm 121 represent the attempts that we use to get help when we find ourselves in trouble. 
They represent an attempt to make it without calling on the Lord for help. And so we too turn elsewhere because we think, either think we can manage by ourselves or maybe that God has more important things to do than to bother with us. It's as though we believe that God cannot be disturbed with little things. But where do we turn then? What are our mountains or hills? What are our solutions? What crutches do we use? Our own wisdom? Our money? Our friends? Our contacts? The internet? Our own strength? There's lots of things we turn to. I'm always impressed with the 12 pins of Connemara, the mountain peaks. But for all of their strength and beauty, they're just, in the end, high hills. And referring to what the traveling Hebrews would have seen on the hills, this is what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 3, 23. He says this, Truly the hills are a delusion, the orgies on the mountains. Or as another version puts it, Surely the idolatrous commotion on the hills and mountains is a deception. Surely in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. And so there's an alternative there, you see. There's turning to the hills for help, which is all of our own efforts. And then there is turning to the Lord. The hills in the end don't amount to anything. No matter how alluring their promises for safety is and security they may be, they are in the end false hope. We delude ourselves when we believe that these hills have any real help to offer. And so Psalm 121 is a song for rejecting all other fruitless attempts of help during life's troubles. Rather, it says in Psalm 121, no less than five times, the Lord watches over you. In verse 1, sorry, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 7, and verse 8, it says the Lord watches over you. But how does the Lord watch over us? We already know from experience that He certainly doesn't keep us from going through difficult or hard times. He doesn't keep us from those things now. The first thing that we're told in verse 3 is this, he who watches over you will not slumber. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So first of all, our God is always present to us. He's always available. We don't have to wake him up like that no good God Baal. One of the jobs of the priests of Baal, one of the jobs was to wake him up. And they weren't always successful. But our God, the God of all creation. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't take a day off. It's not hard to get his attention. He doesn't take a break from wanting to help us. Verse 8 tells us, the Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. Wow. Our God is with us when we begin our journey and he's still with us when we reach our destination. As I think of my own life, the Lord has been with me since I was a child. He's never left me. He's always been there. He's been ever-present, an ever-present help in times of trouble, the Scriptures tell me. And He'll be there into my future, right to the very end. He's going to be there always for me. What comfort that brings there's no point along the journey of life that he's not with you. No matter where you go, he is with you. And he will keep you walking along the whole way. Psalm 121 does not promise that we'll never experience trouble, never trip over a loose stone, but that these things have no evil power over us. There is nowhere in the Bible that you can find a life free from difficulties, there's no more honest book than the Bible. Look at Job. Look at Moses. Look at the life of David. Look at the life of Joseph. Look at the rest of these Psalms. Look at the life and ministry of Paul. Look at Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, his prayer at Gethsemane, the cross. And think of the many strong believers that you know that have had pain and struggle and hard times. 
Do you think less of their faith because they've gone through hard times? The promise here is one of preservation in the midst of hard times, not protection from trouble. Verse 7 of Psalm 121 says, The Lord will keep you from all harm. Jesus taught his disciples to pray something similar. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And according to Scripture, that prayer is answered every day in our lives for those who walk the path of Christian life. Think of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'm going to read them out of the Good News Bible because it gives it an impact. It says, every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise. He will not allow you be, to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the same time you are put to the test, he will give you strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. Notice that last bit. He will give you strength to endure it so that you will so, and so provide you with a way out. Notice the way out is not just simply escape. The way out is the victory over the, the, the hardship to endure. And someone has said that all the water in the world cannot sink a ship unless it gets inside. Well, the same is true of us and the world around us. Unless we get it, let it get inside us, all the evil in the world can do us no ultimate harm unless we bring it in and nurse it. For the Lord keeps us from evil, and there is nothing that can separate us from his purposes for us. In fact, Romans 8, 38 and 39 say this. It says, For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above or the world below, there is nothing in all creation that will ever separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. He couldn't be more emphatic, could he? And Psalm 121, verse 7 says, The Lord will watch over your life. It reminds me of Colossians 3, 33 and 4, which tells us that your life is hidden with Christ in God, and that Christ is your life. Our lives are guarded and kept, and no evil, thanks to the Lord, can get in and sink us. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that he would build his church. And my friends, nothing can sink the church for which he bled and died for either. My help comes from the Lord. Remember then, that the big mistake that we can make when facing illnesses, anxiety, conflict, or whatever, is to conclude that as a result, that this is a sign that there is something wrong with my relationship with God. It's a mistake that Psalm 121 addresses. The inaccuracy of supposing that God's interest in us waxes and wanes in response to our own spiritual temperature. We will face hard times and troubles. Perhaps you're, you are going through a personal time like that right now. We will face troubles as God's people. We're experiencing that test and that, that pressure at the moment, aren't we? Living, living as a Christian is not a heavenly, serene oasis in an otherwise unwelcoming wilderness of the world. It is not a straight open highway with blue skies constantly above us. Many times the illustration in the Bible is that rather of a battlefront, of a casualty department, or a stormy sea. The difference is that each step we take, each breath we breathe, we know that we are held, and protected, and loved by God. This is God's care, what theologians historically have called God's providence. Providence is that action of God at all times and in all circumstances where he loves and guides and cares for his people. It's what God 
provides for us, his providence. This too should shape our heart's attitude to the troubles we now face. As Christians, should we be hanging our heads at the moment, gloomily focused on all that is going wrong in our lives and the world around us? Too often we allow our experiences of the negative to shape us. Psalm 121 challenges that. It tells us that God watches over us. It tells us that our lives are His in His hands. It tells us that He guards us forever. From the time we place our trust in Him until the day we see Him face to face. Our Christian life is not defined by the troubles that we face, but rather by the God that keeps us as we travel with Him. Let this truth sink deep into your heart as we travel along the road of faith together. This psalm, like all psalms, were songs. And we need to keep singing this particular song. It's a song for the road. It's a song for the journey. It's a, it's a psalm that teaches us to look beyond our circumstances and the false hopes of help. We look to God, to our true help, the one who is our Lord and Savior, the one who will not fail us, the one who made heaven and earth. He can truly keep us, as the last verse says, from this time on and forevermore. He gives us faith for the journey, no matter how difficult it may be. During this stage of the journey, friends, let us encourage one another by walking together, by keeping up with each other, keeping pace with one another, keeping close to one another. This is why we have our services. This is why we encourage the Zoom calls, is that we're keeping pace with one another. We're keeping up with one another. We're keeping connected with one another. We don't want anyone to lag behind. We want to be in all of this together. We need each other. Keeping close to one another, talking to one another, sharing our experiences of life. That's where the strength is, in that kind of togetherness. Earlier I referenced Eugene Peterson, and here's his translation of Psalm 121, just to finish the message. I look up to the mountains. Where does my strength... Sorry, I'll start again. I look to the mountains. Does my strength come from the mountains? No. My strength comes from God, who made heaven and earth and mountains. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep. Not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian. Right at your side to protect you. Shielding you from sunstroke. Sheltering you from moonstroke. God, God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. And he guards you always. Amen. Let me pray. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your word is there to bring us life and encouragement and strength. Lord, it reveals to us the kind of God you are. And Lord, we thank you today that we've learned that you never stumble, you never fall asleep. Lord, that your presence is always with us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Because, Lord, we need that today. We need to know, Lord, that you're there for us, that you're there right beside us. Lord, that even though we're experiencing personal trouble and even though we're experiencing trouble together as a church, as with all churches at this moment, Lord, under pressure, Lord, that nevertheless you are with us and that you will guide us through these days. And Lord, that you will even build into us greater strength for the journey as we go. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you today. We commit our lives to you. Lord, if we've never trusted you before, then Lord, this is the day we will begin. This is the day, Lord, that we will put our all of our life into your hands and commit ourselves to your to following you. Lord, there is no greater path. There is no greater companion than you on the journey. 
We thank you for one another, Lord. But Lord, we need you so desperately. And so, Lord, we pray that you come alongside us this week. Bless us, we pray. Strengthen us. For everyone at home who's listening as well, Lord, may you pour out your Holy Spirit into their lives this day. Sustain them during this week. Lord, help us to connect with one another through prayer. And Lord, I pray that as this special month of prayer happens, Lord, that you would be with us. Lord, that you would guide us. Lord, that you would strengthen us. Lord, that you would speak to us about the journey ahead. And so we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Brian is going to come and lead us in a concluding song. Thank you. Sing like 
Let me conclude this morning just with the blessing, the ironic blessing from number six, which just simply says, This you shall bless, thus rather you shall bless the people of Israel. You should say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you. And thank you to all those who have visited us from home this morning as well. God bless you today.